believe la abudu ma ta'budun i do not worship that which you worship wala anta ma'buduna ma a'bud and you do not worship that which i worship and then it's repeated in a slightly different way and then the final statement in this uh, surah lakum dinukum wa liya deen you have your religion i have mine today many muslims including myself we will use this to say that this means that we tolerate each other i have a religion somebody else has another religion we say to that person at the end of the day you have your religion i have mine let's agree to disagree be part ways that's okay but we we're not going to fight over this we recognize each other's religions okay so that's how we use this uh, verse now this the surah as a whole and the, this verse that closes it but the, the critics will say, and those brothers who want to uh, fight against non-Muslims, uh, will say that this verse has been abrogated. This idea that the verse has been abrogated has been picked upon by the critics of Islam, and uh, even by academic scholars who have no interest in, in proving that Islam is wrong, but uh, sometimes they buy into this idea. For example, Jane Damon McAuliffe, in her essay collected in the Cambridge Companion to the Quran, uh, says that even though Muslims will use this as saying uh, that, uh, you know, uh, tolerance in religion, lakum dinukum waliyadeen, you have your religion, I have mine, but the classical Islamic tradition uh, makes it plain that this verse has been abrogated by the fighting verses. So, what did classical Muslim scholars say about this? Jain Damian Macaulay is not wrong. This indeed is what the classical Muslim scholars generally said. They said that uh, there is abrogation in the Quran. And by abrogation, uh, they will mean three things. But let me first use the Arabic term that we are saying means abrogation. The term in Arabic is nasq. Nasr. And uh, in the Quran, in the second chapter, in the 106th ayah, it says, Man min ayatin aw nunsiha, na'ti bi khayrin minha aw mithliha. Uh, there is no... Uh, uh, whatever verse, whatever verse, uh, whatever ayah, let me keep to the original instead of saying verse, let me say ayah, whatever ayah, whatever ayah, we abrogate or cause to be forgotten. We bring one in the place of it that is either better than it or equal to it. We bring one uh, that is better than it or similar to it. Whatever ayah we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or equal to it. So, the classical commentators say, see, that means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have revealed an ayah in the past and then now cancels that ayah or repeals it or abrogates it so it no longer is valid and we'll see the, the three ways that they talked about this. But for the moment, in general, it's no longer valid but Allah has brought an ayah better than the one which is cancelled or equal to the one which is cancelled. Alam ta'ala man Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. And the ayah ends by saying, don't you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do all things? Okay. So they say that this proves abrogation in the three ways now that I will delineate. One way they said is that the both the recitation of the ayah and the application of the ayah are abrogated forever. They say this means that an ayah was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, it had a legal application and uh, the Muslims recited the ayah and they applied the law that comes from that ayah. But both the recitation and the ayah have now been cancelled. So they say that there are several verses like this and because they're no longer here and no legal ramification, uh, so we don't know what, what they are, so they're not being recited any, anymore. But they, they uh, sorry, sorry for saying no legal ramification, but they have legal ramification. So they, uh, but both the recitation and the legal application have been cancelled forever. You don't recite them anymore, you don't apply them anymore. Then they said, the second uh, form 
is that you have an ayah whose recitation has been cancelled, but the legal application remains. The legal application remains. So conceivably that means that there is a verse of the Quran which we consider to have once been a verse of the Quran but no longer a verse of the Quran but whatever uh, legal application it prescribed still applies. The good case in point they use as an example of this is what they refer to as Ayatul Rajim, the verse about stoning. Today, if uh, let's say uh, they, there is a big news about a case of a woman being uh, stoned to death in some part of the world uh, for adultery, whether sometimes you know some Muslim groups newly formed, they decide they want to implement the Sharia and uh, to prove that they're, they're serious about this. Uh, they start applying, you know, cutting up the hands for stealing and, and stoning for adultery. And uh, most often it's the woman who gets caught in this situation because she may be pregnant and this in some classical views is a proof against her that she committed adultery if she's not married. So now this becomes big news. Uh, people want to know, what does your religion say about this? So many students of Islam become, uh, take this up, they want to find out, what does the Quran say about this? So they go into the Quran and they find that the Quran speaks about adultery in the 24th chapter, saying, As for the adulterer, male or female, flog each one of them a hundred lashes. So, to begin with, According to this ayah, both male and female should be brought to justice, not just the female. And second, the, the, the penalty is 100 lashes. It doesn't say stoning. So now, the young Muslim who wants to defend Islam comes forward and says, well, you know, the Quran doesn't say stoning, it only says lashes. But then where does the stoning come from? Well, in the classical tradition it was mentioned that there was an ayah of stoning, Ayatul Rajam. It said, As Shaykhu wa Shaykha, Ida Zanaya, Farjumu, Huma, Al Batta, or Nakalan, as, as a uh, as a um, as a warning. So, as the, the ayah would have said, they said, uh, the classical tradition says that there was an ayah that used to say, As for the Shaykh, or the shaykha, the old man or the old woman, if they commit adultery, stone the two of them as an example, to, to give an example to others. So they say that was an ayah of the Quran, it was once recited by the Muslims and applied, but the recitation no longer applies, which means the recitation is no longer in our book, but the legal ruling from it still applies in that the penalty for adultery, adultery by persons who were once married is now stoning. So now they interpret shaykh wa shaykha uh, to mean a married person, whether a man, man or woman. Whereas, as you know, shaykh in, in Arabic means an old person. Uh, and, and it's used uh, for, for an Islamic scholar because usually the Islamic scholar is a little bit older and uh, you know, age and wisdom is equated. So this way, uh, the sheikh, sheikh means old person, but it's also applied to an Islamic scholar. But now, for this ayah, those who want to apply the penalty of stoning to death for adultery, they say that the ayah said, a sheikh wa sheikha, but it means married person, whether male or female. So now, if we say, look, the ayah said, uh, flogging for adultery, they say, oh, you see that ayah? That ayah is only dealing with the unmarried adulterer and adulteress. Adulterer and adulteress. So we said, but the ayah says, azani wa zaniya. It doesn't say whether married or not, and this is general. But they say, no, we have the hadith that says that this was an ayah. So, so how do we know there is an ayah? There used to be an ayah because a hadith set tells us so. So the answer from those who want to defend that classical tradition is to say that there is a hadith which tells us that there used to be an ayah which prescribed this punishment and the recitation of the ayah has been cancelled and that's why the ayah is no longer in the Quran.
But the application of that ayah still remains and that's why stoning is still the, the regulation in Islam, stoning for adultery. So that's the second uh, type of abrogation that is being spoken about in the classical tradition. Remember now, I said there are three and we dealt with two so far. The first one we said, both the recitation and the application have been cancelled. So, we don't have the verse anymore in the Quran and we don't apply its ruling. So both have been cancelled. The second one, we don't have the verse anymore, but we still have the ruling. So the recitation has been cancelled. This is mansukh tilawa uh, bila hukum. Uh, the, the tilawa has been cancelled, but not the hukum, not the regulation. The regulation remains. Now the third type of, uh, of abrogation the classical tradition spoke about is mansukh al-hukum, the, the cancellation of the legal ruling but not the cancellation of the, of the tilawa, of the recitation. So this now pertains to those verses which are still in the Quran, we are told, and we know the verses are still in the Quran, but we are told that these verses no longer apply. The legal ruling from these verses no longer apply. Which means that in theory, what has to happen now is that the Muslim is reading his Quran, uh, the Muslim goes to any masjid, picks up a copy of the Quran, is reading it, and uh, and has to keep in the back of his mind, maybe the ayah which you are reading does not apply. Because the average Muslim doesn't know which ayah applies and which ayah does not apply. Who knows that? The scholars. And it turns out that sometimes even the scholars cannot really decide which ayah has been cancelled and which has not been cancelled. So what we have then is, uh, for example, if we look into this book called An Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran by, Ammar Yasser, uh, by uh, Abu Ammar Yasir Qadi. Now he has a whole section here dealing with uh, abrogation and he's representing the classical tradition and showing us wh what the classical scholars said about this whole subject of abrogation or nasq. And he shows that in fact uh, uh, some scholars had said some 400 and some verses were, were abrogated and different scholars said different numbers of verses. So typically, if a scholar looks at two verses, let's say A and B, and he finds that the two are like in some bit of tension one with another. It looks like one is saying do X and the other is saying do not do X. So it looks like there is a contradiction. So what does the scholar say? A scholar says, well, one cancel the other one. So only one applies, the other one does not apply. One used to say, do that, and the other one now is saying, we give you a new ruling, uh, don't do that. So how many verses were cancelled? This became now a subject of uh, varying interpretation. Some said 400 and some, some narrowed it down uh, to smaller numbers until in the Middle Ages, uh, Imam Jalaluddin Sayyuti uh, in the author of the book Al Itqan fi Ulum al Quran and narrowed it down to 21 cases where one verse cancels another verse in, in the Quran. And that book, Al Itqan fi Ulum al Quran, has become a very influential book in the same subject matter. Like when we talk about sciences of the Quran, Al Itqan fi Ulum al Quran means the perfection uh, of the sciences of the Quran, or the perfection. Uh, of the sciences of the Quran. So uh, all the details about the Quran, when, what, when the Quran was revealed, how revealed, how to understand the Quran and so on, that is spelled out in that book and that book became like an epitome in that field of study. So, uh, so and it's widely studied today in, in Islamic institutions throughout the world. But that did not end the matter. Shah Waliullah of Delhi is a, an internationally recognized scholar. He came later and uh, he said that in fact only five uh, uh, passages are, are cases of abrogation in the Quran. Uh, this is spelled out in his book uh, Al Fawzul Kabir fi Usul al Tafsir. Uh, the great uh, uh, success uh, in, uh, the, in, in um, in the tafsir of the Quran, in the interpretation of the Quran. Uh, so in, in that book he's saying only five cases of abrogation. So he's gone down now from 21 down to five. 
Now, even if you examine the five cases, remember how we said how the scholars arrived at this idea that they were one verse abrogates the other one? Because they look at the two and they see that the two appear to be in tension one with another. As if one is saying one thing, the other one is saying the other thing. But if you look at even these, cases, these five cases, you will see that these five cases do not actually fit the idea of abrogation in the sense that one verse cancels the other. Abu Ammar uh, Yasir Qadi in his book suggests another possibility, the possibility of taqsis or specification. He says that uh, uh, when the, some of the classical scholars spoke about abrogation, what they meant is taqsis or specification, which is always possible and it's reasonable. Suppose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a thing one way and you might get the impression that that means in a general way. But in another verse, he says it in a more specific way. Now that specific way uh, gives you more details about the general. So, when you want to know how to apply the verses, the two have to be seen in conjunction with each other. And then you understand one in the light of the other. So, the one verse is giving more specific details about the other one. So, it's not that one cancels the other one, but the two of them are in harmony together with one of them giving you more details. This is the best way then to understand these passages. Now this also explains why uh, the uh, scholars differed so much about which verse cancels which one, like how many verses there are uh, uh, that are cases of abrogation. Some said 400 and as he saw Shawali narrowed it down to 5. How could it be? Suppose the Prophet ﷺ was saying, look this verse cancels the other one. Then somebody collected that information, noted it down somewhere. Again, the Prophet ﷺ said, see this other verse, this cancels the other one. So now we have a second case. The Prophet ﷺ says a third time, here is another case. Then a fourth case, then a fifth case, then a sixth case. So we would have every case documented according to what the Prophet ﷺ said, right? But the trouble is, as Imam Abu Jafar al-Tabari says in his tafsir, there is no authentic case where the Prophet ﷺ says that one verse cancels another one. So how did the scholars know that one verse cancels another one? By their looking at the two verses and it looks to them like one verse is saying the other thing than the other verse said. And the quick solution for them was to say one verse cancels the other one. Today, when we read these verses, we should see that they are all in harmony with each other and none actually cancels the other one. They only give you more specifics. One gives you the thing in more a general way, the other one gives it to you in a more specific way, and they are in harmony with each other. So now, when we recognize this, that the Quran does not actually cancel itself in this way, we have to go back to that ayah, which we cited at the beginning. From the second chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 106. It says what? مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا Whatever verse we cancel or cause to be forgotten, uh, we bring one in the place of it uh, that is better than it or like it. Similar verse is in uh, the 16th chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Nahl, the 101st ayah. مَا بَدَّلْنَا آيَةٍ مَكَانَ آيَةٍ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلُمُ مَا يُبَدِّلُ Whenever we uh, bring a, a verse in the place of another one, and Allah knows what exactly uh, he, he is, uh, is bringing, and then the people are, are raising objection. This thing does not agree. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously knows what he is doing. Uh, in, in, in with the, the revelation that is given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when we look at these verses now, what, what should we conclude? In the context of these verses, both in the Surah Al-Baqarah and in Surah Al-Nahl, what Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is talking about is the Qur'an cancelling the previous revelations. See Surah Al-Baqarah as an example. We saw previously that up until the ayah number 142 of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about the creation of the world and the history of Bani Israel and the revelation of the scriptures through Bani Israel. Now we come to the 106th ayah. This now is talking about the Bani Israel 
the revelations that they had being now replaced by the Quran. So the Quran has come on the scene now and the Bani Israel are naturally going to protest. Like we have a revelation from God and now you're bringing us a different one to replace the one that we have. And Allah's answer to that is when we replace a scripture with another like we're doing now, the one which we are giving the, the, as a replacement, this is going to be either better than the one before or equal to it. So that's the, the point now. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them previous ayat or revelations, and now Allah is giving a new revelation that cancels the old one, and it's a new one that comes into effect. So it's not that verses of the Quran cancel each other, but that the Quran replaces the previous scriptures. When we know this now, now it means that what we presented in yesterday's lecture is valid. Remember, we presented verses of the Quran that speak about tolerance, that speak about uh, applying peace and working for peace. And now the critic says, according to the question, the critic says, but all of these no longer apply because your idea of abrogation says that the verses about fighting abrogate the ones about peace. So, Jane Damon, Damon McAuliffe will say, look, uh, the classical tradition says that the verses about tolerance are abrogated. So when Muslims say today, Lakum dinukum waliyadeen, you have your religion, I have mine, this Muslim is not familiar with the classical tradition, which says that basically that tolerance is abrogated and now replaced by fighting. What is our reply to Jane Damon McAuliffe and to critics of uh, Islam and to uh, those who are misapplying the verses of the Quran and uh, engaging in violence in the name of Islam, we say that none of these verses are abrogated. We say that a mistake here occurred in the classical tradition where people thought and it became a trend. People wanted to find verses that abrogate the other one. But there's no agreement on which verses abrogate which verses. Sometimes you have two verses, let's say A and B, and now they seem to be in some tension with each other. Instead of working at resolving the tension, uh, some scholars said, oh, B came later and abrogated A. And some others said, no, it's A that came later and abrogated B. And some scholars say, uh, well, even though A came earlier, A is the st one that abrogates the other one. So sometimes they say the Nasikh, came earlier than the mansukh, but still it abrogates it. So it, uh, th this obviously means that they were not working with definite information. They did not have specific uh, uh, details about which verses abrogate each other. They did not have a statement from the Prophet ﷺ himself, authentically reported from him saying that this one abrogates the other one. Uh, they were basically using an educated guess. They were great scholars, but they followed a trend which was a mistaken trend. Now today, when we look at the Quran, we say the Quran is wholesome. Uh, every verse applies, but each in its proper context. We have to see its historical situation, we have to see the context within the page in which the, the verse uh, applies, like what comes before it, what comes after it, and we have to apply it properly. But every verse has its application. Uh, first, in the time of the Prophet wasallam, and secondarily, in every situation that is similar enough to the original situation. You want to know what is the illa or the reason for this ayah, what is the sabab, what is the, the sabab al-nuzul? The, the, re, the reason for revelation. And we see wherever the same reason uh, still applies, the same verse will apply, the same ruling will apply. Uh, and in some cases, the ruling will not apply because the, the conditions have changed. The sabab is different. It was applied, uh, given for one reason, but the reason no longer exists and so on. So we will reason uh, with these verses and see how best to apply them, but we do not say that one verse cancels another one. And that means we do not say that the peaceful verse are cancelled and replaced by violent verses. We say that violence has a place and a time and a circumstance and a condition 
And the, our situation now is not this, to apply violence. And uh, those brothers of ours who are committing acts of violence, gruesome ones, in the name of Islam, to the extent that they even burned a, 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 a person alive. Can you imagine this? And they said that this is Islam? It's Mislam. We say that they have misapplied the verses of the Quran and uh, even though they try to ally themselves with a classical tradition, even that classical tradition would not su support the extent uh, of their brutality and uh, violence. They are wrong and the, the lecture that we presented yesterday is correct, uh, that uh, there are peaceful verses in the Quran and that is what is pre pre uh, prevailing and that's what we should fo be following uh, today. And the violence has its place, but this is not the place. It has its time and this is not the time. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have because we have to break our fast today. But we'll continue to deal with this subject in future lectures, inshallah, tomorrow, same time, 8.30, half an hour before Maghrib. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.